When I was a kid, um, I lived across the street from a grocery store. And in that grocery store, there were three arcade games, uh, one of which I was severely addicted to. I mean, like crackhead addicted to, you know? Um, I was at that game every chance that I got. Uh, and that game was Street Fighter. And I was always in front of that game. I was obsessed with that game because I think there was like a little ninja that lived inside of me. So I was nurturing him and training him. Um, so anyway, one day I was walking across the street from my house to go to the grocery store, and there was this gentleman standing there, and he was selling newspapers. And uh, he asked me, did I want a newspaper? And of course, I didn't want a newspaper, so I said, no, sir, thank you, and I, I walked away from him. But he called me back. And when he called me back, he started engaging me in conversation about politics and education and things that were happening in the community at the time. And you got to understand, this is 1991, and Rodney King had just been savagely beaten by four LAPD officers. Crack was literally ravaging the inner cities across America, and gang violence was at an all-time high. So I talked to him for a little while, and uh, you know I obliged him in conversation. But to be honest with you, I'm kind of looking straight through this man because all I can think about is Street Fighter. So I turn, and I walk away, and he calls me back again. But this time when he called me back, he actually said something that piqued my interest. He asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I love that question because here I am, 11 years old, and I'd always known what I wanted to be. So I looked him in his eyes and I said, I want to be a filmmaker. So he kind of looked me up and down for a minute, stared me in my eyes, and then he said, we don't need any more filmmakers. We need politicians, and we need lawyers, and we need doctors. We need people that are going to make a long-lasting and impact on our community. Man, I, that took the wind out of me. Because again, like I said, here I am. I'm 11 years old. I'd always known what I wanted to do. And here this man is telling me that this career path that I'd chosen, or really that had chosen me, was kind of pointless. So needless to say, I walked away from that meeting. I was a little bit depressed, you know, that 11-year-old depression. Um, I'm depressed, and I'm contemplative, and I'm asking myself, like, what is the point of this career that I've chosen? So let's jump forward a few months. I'm sitting in a movie theater, and I'm about to watch this film. Uh, this film has Ice Cube in it, and it's made from this new director out of Los Angeles. He wasn't really known at all. He had just graduated from film school. But everybody had been talking about this film and how great it was. So I'm sitting there, waiting for the lights to go down. They're playing like the trailers or whatnot. And then finally, the lights go down, and the film starts. And this movie is Boys in the Hood, by the way. And I'm there, and I'm watching this film. And within the first five minutes of me watching it, I'm transfixed. And I'm transfixed because for the first time in my life, I actually felt power, I mean palpable power, come across a screen and send a shockwave through a theater. And not only that, there were people on that screen who had been demonized and vilified in the media, and finally they were given back their humanity and given the opportunity to tell their stories the way that they experienced them. So here I am, I'm sitting in this movie theater, I'm 11 years old, I'm crying, there's somebody next to me crying to my right and my left, and I know these people that are next to me, and I know that they're crying because they're finally convicted, because they see themselves on this screen. And this movie, it's making them ask all of these deep questions about themselves, like, will I end up dead because of a bullet? Can I go to college? Will I be a drug dealer for the rest of my life? Can I make it out of here? And so as I'm sitting there and I'm seeing this experience happen in front of me, I think all the way back to my man in front of the grocery store. And I said, he just doesn't know. He has no idea that just like a lawyer, a filmmaker can liberate people. And just like a doctor, a filmmaker, he can heal people. And just like a community activist or a politician, a filmmaker, he can galvanize the community and make people excited about who they are. And I was hooked. Like I said before, I'd always known what I wanted to do, but this moment, gave me a reason for wanting to do it. So the next few years I spent studying filmmakers, 
who were using their voice to combat societal ills. I'm studying Spike Lee, of course, Haley Garima, Charles Burnett, the Los Angeles School of Black Filmmakers, Italian neorealism, just filmmakers and film uh, films from all over the world that were using their voice as a way to comment on society. And as I'm watching all of these films, I start noticing these similarities, these traits, as I'll call them. And so I took pen to pad, and I started to write these things down. And there were three main things that I wrote down, and these are the three things that I use today as a filmmaker whenever I get ready to create anything. The first thing that I noticed is that these artists, they were very aware of what was going on in the world around them. Yes, I know art. The creation of art is a very intimate act. It's a very private act. But if you're going to have a long-lasting impact on people, you have to know what's going on with them. You have to know what they're fighting against. You have to know what's on the social consciousness of people, because if you're going to touch someone, you have to know what they're trying to crawl from underneath. Secondly, these artists were insightful. right? They, were, they weren't judgmental. They didn't judge the characters that they were putting on screen. They looked past what a person did, and they found out who they were. And in doing that, they gave humanity, as I said earlier, back to characters or people that had been demonized and vilified in the media. And once they gave those people back their humanity, they made them more accessible to a larger audience because people could look past the exterior and see deep inside of them. And thirdly, these artists were transparent, right? Art has to be transparent. As an artist, I have to pour my fears and my wants and my needs and all of these deep, deep, deep down hidden emotions that I have, I have to pour them into my work because once I pour them into my work, again, it makes the work more accessible to you because my transparency makes you more transparent. When you see me opening myself up, when you witness that work, now you can open yourself up. The great Czech philosopher and artist Vaclav Havel said that art extends far beyond itself. It creates a special force field around itself that moves the human mind and the human spirit. Now, what does that really mean? You know, that's a deep, deep, deep quote. But really, all that means to me is art is alive, right? Art is a living, breathing being birthed from the soul of its creator. You see, we fertilize our art with our emotional sensitivity. Right? And then we gestate it in our hearts, feeding it from our spiritual umbilical cord. And then when it's ready, we give birth to it. And then even after we give birth to it, we continue to shape it, and we continue to mold it, and we continue to pour ourselves into it until it's ready to go out into the world. And once we send that art out into the world, we know that it's ready to impact, inspire, and change the people that it was created for. This soul art, as I call it, leaves such an indelible imprint on the minds, bodies, and spirits of the viewer that they'll never forget it. And not only will they never forget it, but they'll never be the same for experiencing it. staff right now. Sound like something you're interested in? If it pays. Daddy, I need $1,500 so I can go to school. I ain't got that kind of money. This perversion has eaten away at you because you haven't dealt with it properly. I'll be behind you the whole way, and when you're sure this is gone, come back. This can't come out. It will destroy the people. Continue to lie to them will destroy them even more.
Leave your donation on the table. Make yourself comfortable. You gonna dance for me? Thank you.